So ladies and gentlemen, we are still, yes, it is Mother's Day, and I promise what I'm going to do is marry uh, Mother's Day in with our Culture Code series. I love this combination. I love this combination. So the title of my message today is Raising World Changers. And I want to share a quick story that actually Pastor Jurgen had shared with me about the story of Nestle, the coffee company. I know, seems strange, but you'll get it later. So Nestle had tried for decades and decades to get into China with their coffee, their market. But after decade after decade, they failed attempts, failed attempts. Because what they were up against is a thousands of years of tea drinking culture. They didn't want coffee. They didn't like coffee. They had a tea drinking culture. And after another failed attempt, they went back to the board and re-strategized. And they thought to themselves, we may not be able to change thousands of years of of a tea drinking culture in our older generation. However, if we target the emerging generation, we might be able to create a desire for coffee. And so what they did, Nestle then started, started creating candies that were flavored in coffee, coffee flavored ice cream, coffee flavored treats. And you better bet that those kids started snatching those things up and they started to to develop a taste and a liking for coffee. And because they targeted the emerging generation, China is one of their biggest markets for Nestle today. It's incredible. Yes, so they weren't thinking short term, they thought long term. They thought next generation. They didn't expect immediate change, but they knew it would come if they were patient and just kept targeting the emerging generation. So I want to put it to you today that if we want to change the future, we have to target the emerging generation. Amen. And when I look at America today, if I'm being honest, I I kind of feel like the world has done a better job at targeting the next generation that the church has done. And that needs to change. That needs to change. We can see how intensely the world has gone after our children and the generations that are rising. When we send our kids to public schools and colleges, they're no longer teaching them. Our our school system has now become an indoctrination system of the liberal agenda, ungodly beliefs, and they're calling it education. Uh, We send our it grieves me so much when we, when we send our children to school and to college, we send them off as believers, as, as Christians. And then when they get to return to us, they are gender confused atheists that hate America and disrespect authority. This ought not to be so. We need to go after the emerging generation as fiercely and as intensely as our adversary has. Things are shifting in Jesus name. And I'm telling you, liberals never cease to amaze me. They can't even leave Mother's Day alone. Mother's Day. A liberal organization put this statement out this past week. It says, there is nothing unique or special about motherhood. Anyone can become a woman at any time. Those who give birth are not women, but merely birthing people. Oh, no. Oh, no, I am sorry. I refuse to allow this nonsense to be taught, this nonsense to be believed as long as I'm alive and as long as you're alive. Absolutely not. I'm telling you, there's a new day dawning, a new day rising, a new generation of believers that are wise, they're discerning, they have the truth, they know the truth, and they have the courage to speak it. We have a generation rising that knows how to pray and to know how to stand up for what is right and what is good, and that is so courageous they will not back down. There is a new generation arising, and I want to prophesy right now that this is the generation. This is the generation of Davids, of Daniels, of Joels, of Jeremiah's, of Moses's, of Noah's, was of Shadrachs, of Meshachs, of Abednego's, of JL's, and Esther's. Yeah. Esther 4.14 says, for if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's household will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther was confronted with the call that God had placed on her life for such a time as this. And Esther arose 
She arose, even though her life was on the line, and she approached the king, and she declared the truth. And because she had the courage and the boldness to tell the truth, an entire nation was saved because of one woman's courage and boldness. Amen? And here's the thing, guys. God knew exactly. He knew exactly what would be happening in the earth at this very time. And he chose you and your children to be a part of the earth at this time. For such a time as this. So you know what that tells me about you and your children? That there is courage on the inside of you. That you are, you are warriors on the inside. And we are raising up warriors. There is a destiny on the inside of you. Because you're supposed to be the answer to everything that is going on in the earth. We carry the answer and his name is Jesus Christ. So for such a time as this, you are here. Some of we may maybe been shrinking back going, oh, what do I do? I want to move. I want to hide. I want to like put my kids in a cave and keep them safe and all this stuff. No, 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 no. You are here to bring the solution, to raise up warriors and believers that carry the truth and that will fight back for such a time as this. God put you and your children in the earth, in the earth. We will not relive Judges 2.10. We will not be Judges 2.10. It says, after that generation died, another generation grew up who did not know the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done. For Israel. Judges 2.10 is not our story. Amen. Amen. So if we're going to change the emerging generation and change this generation, I just want to share a few quick points with you that I think might help. Is that going to be good? Are we in it? We ready? Okay. The first point is to make the house of God a non-negotiable. The house of God needs to be a non-negotiable. Hebrews 10.25 says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. What does that mean? All the more as we see the day approaching. When theologian and Bible scholars believe that the day approaching is what we're talking about in end times, the second coming of Jesus, coming back in the clouds, trumpet sound, boom. Okay, so so here's the deal. When these things are happening, uh, all the more we need to be in the house of God to be built up with courage and strength. And I don't know about you guys, but there's been times in this chaos when I saw the fire burning from a distance from my house and the sirens going off all night long. I, I, I looked into the sky and I'm like, was that a trumpet? <laughs> like, is that you coming, Jesus? <laughs> is that you? <laughs> because seriously, it's been crazy, right? It's been crazy. So is being in the house of God a priority to you? especially in the last days? Is it a habit in your home? And like all behaviors, like they, they learn, our children learn from observation and modeling. So what are they observing when it comes to our church attendance? What are we modeling when it comes to our church attendance? Is it something that we do no matter what, or is it something we do when nothing else is on? What are we modeling? What are we communicating to our children about what the house of God, the priority of that should be? I hear some parents, and God bless them. Well, shouldn't I just allow my kids to make up their own mind? I mean, especially when they're teenagers, shouldn't they make their own decision? I know God bless them. So my response is things like this, and I'll I'll reference my own family. Say, okay, so if I let my children make their own choices, they would eat candy for every meal, Slurpees would be the form of hydration. They would never brush their teeth, ever. They would never take a shower, even when I had them smell their own armpits, and they acknowledge that they stink. They still don't want to take a shower. True story. If I let my children make their own decisions, they would literally pee in public, and they would talk about bowel movements and make farting noises at the dinner table every night. No, no, no. We would never allow our children to make their own decisions with those silly little things. So why would we ever let our children make a decision about a matter that is literally life and death, the path of life or destruction? We cannot, we cannot let our children make our own deci- their own decisions in this area. Then I hear other parents say, well, I'm just choosing my battles. Just choose, and I know where that place is coming from. They're worn out. They're tired. They're, they're choosing their battles. But, and I, I, I choose my battles too. I mean, 
I choose not to battle over wearing costumes in public <laughs> or letting my boys wear a hat to church or I don't battle and make them eat my meatloaf even though it's good. <laughs> I choose my battles. I don't want to fight those, but I will fight this one. Yeah. Being in the house of God that will determine their entire life's path on the narrow or the broad path that leads to destruction. The house of God needs to be a non-negotiable, amen? And if I can humbly take a moment to speak to the men in this church. Men, we love you. But as a wife and as a mom, I need you to know that we need you to lead in this area. We need you to lead in this area. Your wife does not want to have to beg and plead and try to get their family to church. We need you. And I'm telling you, if that has been the pattern in your home, I need you to know that your heart's, your wife's heart is just breaking a bit. And your, your wife's heart is becoming anxious and fearful if she can trust your decision making. And your wife's anxious heart will then eventually turn to fear, which will then turn to control. We need you to lead us. We want you to lead us. We love you, men. We believe in you. Let this be a day that things start to shift in your home, and you will be blessed because of it. Amen? Amen. Amen. The second thing, to raise up world changers. Be your child's parent, not their friend. AKA, discipline your children. You can be friends with them forever when they're grown. You have a whole lifetime to be their friend. But while they're in your care, under your roof, or under the age of 18, you are their parent. That is your first priority. And I know this, this uh, topic of discipline can be touchy for parents, but I think usually why it's touchy is because it wasn't modeled well for them or it was overdone in an abusive way growing up. But we're not talking about those ways. We're actually talking about the biblical way. So I want to share with you what the Bible actually says about this. So please just don't get offended at me for having the courage to read the Bible. I'm just going to share with you like what the Bible says. Proverbs 13, 24. Those who spare the rod of discipline, what does it say? Hate their children. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. Proverbs 22, 15. A youngster's heart is filled with foolishness, but physical discipline will drive it far from them. These scriptures do not encourage abuse. But spanking our children and not sparing the rod in a loving way to bring correction to save them from making the decisions that will head down a path of destruction. The spanking and the rod will drive out their foolish ways far from them. Amen? Amen. And I venture to say, not all, but I would say the majority of the individuals throwing tantrums in the street, burning down buildings, disrespecting our officers, stealing things, disrespecting authority, and rioting, I would say more than likely not, their parents did not use the rod of correction when they were young. And honestly, when I look at that stuff happening, I want to do two things. I want to spank all their little butts. And then I want to tell them about the love of Jesus in that order. Amen. Amen, Pastor Becky. Our children need to be disciplined by us, their loving parents, when they are young, so they don't have to be disciplined by the criminal justice system. Oh, my goodness. I remember when Hudson, it was his birthday. He was either six or seven. I can't remember. And I was giving them, you know, the baths at the end of the night. And Hudson was just being a little turkey. It was probably the sugar. But that doesn't mean that I get to excuse all poor behavior. So... He was just being disrespectful. He wasn't listening. He was causing havoc. So I picked his slippery wet body up out of that bathtub, and I gave him a whopping on his behind. And he looks at me. He's like, Mom, 
on my birthday? I'm like, yes, I just spanked you on your birthday and I'll spank you at Christmas too if you behave like that. That behavior is not tolerated in our household. I'm gonna drive that far from you, bam, bam, bam. He didn't misbehave in the bath anymore. Our children need parents, not friends. You have plenty of time to be their friend later in life, amen? All right, we need to teach our children how to pray. I thank God for our kids' church and our junior high and our high school ministries and our young adult ministries, our prayer meetings with the men at 5.30 on Tuesday mornings and our prayer meeting with the women at 7.30 on Thursdays. I am so grateful for our church teaching our children and us how to pray. I'm talking about bold prayers. I'm talking about declarative prayers. I'm talking about healing prayers, authoritative prayers, demon trembling kind of prayers, teaching our children. Not the, oh, if it be your will, if you could, Jesus, can you help with? No, no. The Bible teaches us to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Hebrews tells us in 416 to approach God's throne with grace, with boldness and confidence. Have we taught them to push back the kingdoms of darkness with their prayers? Because if we don't, they've already lost. Because our battle is not necessarily in the natural, it is in the spiritual. The Bible tells us that in Ephesians 6, 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So if we don't teach them how to push back the power of darkness and, and declare authoritative prayers that they understand the power that they carry, they will never win the next generation because that's how it's going to be won in prayer, pushing back the powers of darkness. Amen? For my entire kids' lives, either John or I or both of us have prayed every night with them. And they've listened to our prayers their whole life. We've modeled it, what powerful and effective prayers look like. And now they have followed suit. My children pray for the nation. They pray against wickedness and corruption. They pray for supernatural hearing, healing. They pray for blessing. They pray that, um, that light would come into the nation of America. And my eight-year-old daughter every night prays that Gavin Newsom would be recalled and that the stupid masks would go away. And one of her prayers is getting answered pretty soon here. Gavin Newsom is gonna be recalled. And I dare to say her prayers helped make that decision happen. We need to teach our kids how to pray and understand the spiritual realm. When my boys were three and two, something kind of started and shifted in our household and it was always pretty peaceful. And, and when Hudson was three, he started, uh, you, know, you know when your kids are like scared or it's a whine cry, but like you like recognize that terrifying scream pitch. And so out of nowhere, this started happening with our three-year-old Hudson. So he'd be playing peaceful, whatever. Then all of a sudden, he would screech, and he would start shaking, and he would point to somewhere in the room, and he was trying to say something, but we didn't really understand what he was saying. And we didn't think much of it. We would just comfort him and be like, you don't have to be scared. Mommy, Daddy, you're here. But it just kept happening. And then when his two-year-old little brother, at the exact same time, they would both screech and scream and shake and point. And now we realize they were saying lions, but they would say it's a Wyatt, it's a Wyatt. And they're in their cute little voices, they'd be screaming and shaking. And they were like, oh my gosh, this is demonic. There is a demonic spirit of fear trying to oppress my two and three year old little boys. And so mom and dad, we'd go in there and we didn't try to give them a four point bullet message on how to have authority in prayer. All we said was no lions in Jesus name, get out of here. And so every time we'd go running when they would scream and then we would point where they're pointing and we would just say that same thing. And then one day, I'm in the kitchen cooking on the stove, and I hear the scream. I'm halfway down the hall, and all of a sudden, I hear these two little mighty voices say, No boy is in Jesus' name! <laughs> Before I even got through them, then all of a sudden, they're all peaceful, and they went back to playing. And so I just like looked. I didn't want to like, I'm like, I'm going to let them have their moment. And I was like, Oh my gosh. My two and three-year-old already started to begin their, to understand their authority and the power that they have over the enemy. 
We need to teach our children how to pray and how to warfare. Amen? Amen. 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 Point number four. We need to teach our children the truth, but then to also have the courage to speak it. I think, sadly, some of the fruit that we're seeing in the earth right now is we had a whole bunch of Christian and believers and pastors that knew the truth. The truth had set them free, but then they didn't have the courage to speak it. So they never, they never modeled courage to the younger generations and how to stand up for what's right. They actually shrunk back out of fear of man and cared more about their comfort and being liked than they did about actually sharing the truth to set people free. And I think, sadly, our children are going to have to fight some battles they really shouldn't have had to fight because we didn't fight them for them. So in a time where truth is so desperately needed, we need to know the truth, first of all, to teach our children the truth. And our children have to know the truth so when they're confronted with the lie, they recognize it as a lie. Because what we've seen is a whole generation being swept up in this lie that is destroying their lives. Our kids need to understand what the truth is and how to unravel the lies so that not just them could be set free, so others that have been in bondage could be set free. And then we can teach the next generation. If we want to change the future, we've got to change the next generation. Our kids have to know the truth, and we have to teach them courage. Because George Oswald Oswald said it best when he said this, the further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. And we have drifted pretty far. We will be hated. We will be persecuted. We just have to understand that we can't back down no matter what. We have to model the truth to our kids. Do our kids see us speaking the truth or or have we cowered? And I understand there are some fierce bullies out there. Let's be honest. We were getting DMs saying, we wish you would die and your kids would die and all these, like people are crazy. So I understand that standing up for the truth in this time of chaos has been difficult, but can I implore you, can I encourage you, we need your voice for such a time as this. We need you to be brave and bold and speak the truth so others can be set free. We need you, you help you help us untangle the lies that people are trapped in. We need our, to teach our children courage. Otherwise, this situation will never change. Do they see truth being spoken and courage being displayed in your lives? I know it was, it was over the summer when uh, you know, and we were happy as a church, absolutely happy to close down for a couple weeks because we didn't know what we were dealing with. We wanted to make sure everyone was safe and we weren't putting unnecessary risk on people. We were happy to close for a few weeks. And then we even extended that time because we didn't fully know what we were dealing with. But then when we actually read the facts and when we actually realized there was no end in sight to this lockdown and closing of worship, places of worship, We realized it was actually no longer about our protection and our safety. It was about control and shutting down the voice of truth and shutting down our religious freedom. So at some point, we said enough is enough. And so we started services again, didn't we? And we tried to make them happy by being out in the parking lot. But then even when we were in the parking lot, they still didn't like how we were doing it in the parking lot. And they they just kept manipulating and changing the rules every week. We're like, you know what? Nah. We actually obey God. We don't obey evil dictators that are trying to shut down our freedom to worship. It's a virtuous rebellion and a rebellion that needed to happen. And I remember in that season... You know, when we're all getting the letters that we could be arrested and go to jail, and I know Pastor Jurgen and Leanne were always like, we'll be the first to go. But John and I had to have some conversations around this. We actually had to talk about what it might look like if we got arrested. And we had to have this conversation with my three kids. If mommy and daddy get arrested, I told them three things. One, you don't have to worry because God's gonna keep us safe. Two, if we go away in those, those police cars, we'll have an entire army down at the prison banging down the walls to set us free. And three, mommy used to be a probation officer, so I know a lot of those sheriffs. I'm like, we're gonna be good, you don't have to worry. But still, it's, it wouldn't, it's not something I wanted to do and I hope to God it never happens or never does, but we don't know. Crazy things are happening right now in the world. 
But the night we were outside worshiping, having a worship night, I remember three cop cars pulled into the parking lot. And right when I just, I, I, now I saw them, but I just kept worshiping and I just kept focusing on Jesus. But I felt my boys come in real close and they put their arms around me. And then Henley turned from worshiping to then burying her head in my tummy, repeatedly crying, I don't want you to go to jail. I don't want you to go to jail. I don't want you to go to jail. When these things started to happen, we had a few people say that it was a little bit reckless of me as a mother. And they tell me things like, your family and your children are your priority. Why are you doing this? And I'm like, exactly. They are my priority. That's why I'm doing this. Because if we back down as their parents, their role models, their leaders, what hope would it be for them when they're grown and their freedom to worship and their freedom to think? We had to draw a line in the sand. This is not happening to my children or to their children or to any of us. It is so much bigger than my comfort and just my three children. It's about all of our children and the generations to follow. We are doing the right thing. We are standing our ground and we will push back the powers of darkness and say, not on our watch, not on our watch. We are here not just for our generation, but the generations to follow. Amen, amen. There is a story in 2 Kings 20, verses 16 through 19 about a wicked king, King Hezekiah, and I'll read you this for you. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon and nothing shall be left, says the Lord. So basically you're gonna lose everything you have. And then they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the kings of Babylon. So basically some of your sons will be taken away into captivity and be slaves. Horrible. You would think he would just be devastated at this word. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he said, will there not be peace and truth at least in my days? Selfish, wicked. That he only thought literally about himself. He didn't even care enough to try to fight to change things for his own sons. It is pure wickedness if we only think about ourselves and what we're experiencing in our little lifetime here, we need to think about this generation, the next generation, the generations to come. I think about my children's children and their grandchildren. I think about what they'll be doing then, what the state of the world will be. And if I have anything to say about it, I wanna leave them with more hope than we feel like we may have today. But I am telling you, like I said, there is a new day dawning because we are raising up warriors in the house of God that know how to pray, that know how to push back the powers of darkness, that know the truth and have the courage. They've got to have the courage to stand up for it. They're gonna make the house of God a priority and not stand back and let wicked, evil tyrants rule and tell us what to do. We obey Jesus, not wicked kings. We believe in this generation. We believe in the next generation and then the emerging generation after them. We are a church of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so on. So I wanna just encourage you today. If you look out at the world and you feel discouraged, you feel like you wanna hide a cave and store up food, which, you know, sometimes might be a good idea. But I'm just saying, don't fear. You don't have to fear. No weapon formed against us shall prosper in Jesus' name. And we are raising, raising up kingdom mindset warriors that will fight the good fight, that will not back down. There are greater days ahead. The future is bright. A new day is dawning. We are raising up world changers. Amen? Amen. Let's give God a huge shout of praise. God is so good. I'm so grateful for our church. I'm gonna close this service and I would just love if everyone would uh, bow their heads and close their eyes. 
You may be in here today and you have never surrendered your life to Jesus. You've never given your heart to Him and received forgiveness for all of your past mistakes. And today you wanna to make that decision and secure your eternity in heaven and, and not just for the afterlife, but to live an epic life now. Or maybe you're in here today and at one point you gave your life to Jesus, but you found yourself in some of my message here, you kind of strayed. And there's two groups of people in here that have strayed, ones that have gone on a really dark path for a really long time. But I think some of you have just so ever slightly veered off path. You haven't committed some crazy sins, but you just know you're off course. God just wants to give you the opportunity today to reroute and get back on that path of life, of blessing, of favor, of strength, of hope and joy. So if you are in here today and you're one of those two people, you wanna surrender your life to Jesus and receive forgiveness for your sins, or you just wanna say, God, I just, I just wanna get back on track. I need to get back on track. If you're one of those two people and no one else is looking around, can you just lift your hand up nice and high so I know who to include in my prayer? Yes, I see these two hands down the front. Yes, beautiful, two hands in the orange and the green, yes. And over here, yes, I saw those two hands, the yellow and the, up all the way up the back, I see you, beautiful. And right here, I see you, young man, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. I see another hand up the back, over upon this side. I see you, gorgeous, with the curly hair and the tank top. I see you, sir, in the black, and I see you, sir, in the gray t-shirt. Thank you, Jesus. I see you, yes, over here in the green. And I see you with the purple shirt in the black, I see you. And the white cardigan, I see you. And I, someone's up the back here, I can't quite see who you are. Amen, yes, I see you, beautiful. You look stunning today, that black purse wrapped around you, I see you. Anyone else, is there anyone else that hasn't lifted their hand? Yes, I saw you, beautiful. Amen, I feel like I could keep going like this. Yes, I see your hand, the Spirit of God is just moving. You know what we're gonna do? Here's the deal. We're all gonna pray a prayer together and you're gonna receive salvation, you're forgiven, you're set free, all of it can happen in your seat. And there's absolutely no pressure to do what I'm about to ask you to do. But I will put this request forward. Sometimes when we lift our hand and we pray the prayer in our seat, sometimes we risk staying on the benches and we risk leaving here and everything stays the same and you thought you heard God, but nothing's changing. If you wanna make sure that's not your story, you really wanna connect with Jesus. You really want to do this life differently than you've been doing it. In a moment, I'm gonna ask everyone to stand to their feet. And if you lifted your hand, I would absolutely love the opportunity to just pray over you, over you down the front. So as everyone's standing to their feet, we're gonna be cheering those that are gonna be making their way. I would love to connect with you, absolutely remove all pressure, but I would love, I would love to meet with you down the front. We wanna cheer you and celebrate you, praise God for you. So many hands were up, I'd love to pray with you down the front. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's keep cheering them on as they come. Let's keep cheering them on. So many people are coming down. Praise God, praise God. Yes, beautiful Emily. Yes, beautiful Emily. Amen, amen. Who else? Yes, gorgeous girls. Beautiful, beautiful. People are still coming. We're still cheering. Such a powerful moment. Generations are being changed right now. It's not just their life, it's their children's lives and their children's children's lives. Praise God. Thank God for your courage to come down to the front. I'm so proud of you. And I know there's so many more of you in their seats and that's okay. We're all gonna pray this prayer together. You don't have to pray it alone because now you belong to the family of God. So we're all gonna pray this prayer with you, okay? Say, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me for sending Jesus to die on a cross, to take my punishment for my sins. Today I declare that I am forgiven, that I am washed clean, 
that you remember my sin no more. God, I thank you for your forgiveness, for your life, for the change that's coming to my life. Today I declare that you are my father and I am your child. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amazing. So good. If you came down the front, we have people behind you that just want to give you a Bible. They want to give you a book. And if you have any questions or needs, please let us know. So while we're closing out the service, these people just want to take two minutes of your time. And so if you all can just take a little break over here for two minutes in our response line. I promise it's not creepy. The lights aren't on. It's a very nice place. No, no weird things happen in there. Just beautiful connection and prayer. We don't need to worry about that. All right, let's cheer them on as they go. Thank you, Lord, for these beautiful lives. Salvation coming to their household and the household following. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God, we just pray over you. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for the beautiful gift of mothers. God, I thank you for this message. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that it would ignite something in them, for them to realize, God, that they were placed here on this earth for such a time as this, that they are a part of the solution. They are a part of the reconciliation. They are a part of changing the generation of the emerging generation. God, I thank you for each and every one. They would leave here today feeling encouraged and excited about the future because their destiny is here in the future to change all things, to turn out everything for good. So Lord, I thank you right now. You're blessing each and every person and especially each and every mother in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our locations, team, and what we do here at Awakened Church, go to awakenedchurch.com.